So welcome everybody. Welcome to those in the room and those online to the Borders Center closing lecture of 2022. We are recording this event for the benefit of those who cannot make it here today. I hope you do not mind. Um, my name is Violeta Moreno Lax, I'm Professor of Law here at Queen Mary University of London, and I am the founding director of the Center. The Center was founded quite recently in 2022, and it focuses on the study of bordering, ordering, and ordering processes through law. So it is the full name, is the Center for the Legal Study of Borders, Migration, and Mobility. It constitutes, or at least it aspires to constitute an excellent hub for the intellectual collaboration and evaluation of the role of law in making and unmaking borders and analyzing the impact on global immobility. And today is a particularly um, special day since we have the opportunity to welcome our dear colleague who will be soon leaving Queen Mary University of London for um, other endeavors. And so this is a great opportunity to celebrate him and his scholarship and his contribution to the development of border studies at large and to put him parallel in the context of this closing lecture 2022. So Professor Sami Smitsilekas, welcome and thank you very much for being here with us today to close the program of activities of 2021-2022. Um, the lecture will discuss the very timely issue of the proliferation of extraterritorial immigration and border controls, which have been increasingly accompanied by the extension of a preventive agenda, particularly in the European Union context. The lecture will evaluate critically the current transformation of the EU external border into a site of preventive, preventive injustice by examining the shift from the prevention of migrant access to the territory of the EU member states to the prevention of access to law. It will put forward a multi-level taxonomy of preventive injustice, examining the uses and abuses of pushbacks, non-entry, instrumentalization and detention policies that we witness in EU member states, particularly since the crisis of 2015, and the recent EU legal proposals, including those put forward as part of the new pact on migration and asylum. And the idea is to highlight the challenges that this preventive paradigm poses to the European rule of law. For those who do not yet know him, although there are probably very few in that category, Professor Balsamis Mitsilekas is Professor of European Criminal Law and Global Security. He's the Director of the Criminal Justice Center and the Deputy Dean for Global Engagement in Europe at Queen Mary University of London. His research interest and expertise lie in the fields of European criminal law, migration, asylum and borders, security and human rights, and this including the impact of mass surveillance on privacy, as well as legal responses to transnational crime, including organized crime and money laundering. From 20, 2001 to 2005, he served as a legal advisor for the House of Lords in the European Union Committee, and he remains a regular advisor to think tanks, parliaments, and governments in Europe and beyond. He has a very extensive list of publications, and I'm going to highlight of the seven monographs and over 150 articles that he's published three books, EU Criminal Law, which is currently in its second edition with Hart um, Publishing, which is launched in 2022, EU Criminal Law after Lisbon with Hart as well, and the criminalization of migration in Europe with Springer. So without further ado, Valsamis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction, Violetta. It's such a pleasure for me to be here, to see all of you here in person. This is wonderful. Uh, after many months of isolation, I think, and thank you to the colleagues who are following online. Uh, this center is already a triumph. It's thanks to Violetta's efforts and to Nicolette's as well. Uh, and it uh, demonstrates really the, the critical mass of strength that we have uh, within the department beyond in the field of migration law. Uh, it is uh, quite tricky, I think, to be in front of you today. I think this is probably my last 
public speaking in my capacity as a Queen Mary member of staff. Uh, it has been 17 years uh, at Queen Mary. Uh, it's such a pleasure to see all of you here, to see so many of uh, uh, our wonderful PhD students and those of you who have already become wonderful early career researchers after your PhD. I think it's a testament uh, to what uh, the department has been doing right and I hope it will continue. Uh, it, for me personally, I think it's, uh, it, it is even a greater joy, if you like, because uh, bringing immigration law to the, to the Department of Law has been one of my priorities as head of department here. So, you know, I served for six years and, uh, you know, some of my uh, smartest moves are, first, first of all, to appoint Violetta uh, and, uh, <laughs> and a number of other wonderful colleagues in the field of migration law. And I think seeing you all here, uh, I think is a testament to how much this field has grown. We have this fantastic LLM program uh, in immigration law. Uh, we have really the best uh, LLM program and the best uh, PhD program in the field of immigration law, uh, I think in, at least in the UK and beyond. So, you know, and this is something that is a great achievement and it is very rewarding for me, not only in view of my uh, personal research interest in immigration law, but also from the perspective of university leadership. And I think, you know, it's really, really a great pleasure to be with you today and to, uh, to discuss more issues regarding to, to immigration control. And I think today what I wanted to, uh, to discuss with you within the now vast field of extraterritorial immigration control. And like I, I know a number of you in the, in the room and those of you at, even I don't know, I'm sure are touching upon this one way or another in your PhD programs or in your research. So, you know, this, this field has become huge and it has become huge because it reflects actually efforts by states, especially states in Europe, to stop migrants from not only coming into the territory, but also stop them from reaching the border itself. So, you know, so all it, immigration, European migration policy currently is all about uh, stopping migrants coming. And a number of scholars in immigration law has, uh, has, has uh, characterized this as the politics of deflection, you know, as the politics of deterrence, uh, and I, I use the, the term prevention because I borrow theoretically from uh, criminal law scholarship. Uh, uh, there is a seminal uh, volume uh, published by Ashworth and Zedner from the University of Oxford called Preventive Justice. What they did is that they, they aim to map the evolution of preventive justice or injustice in the context of English criminal law and looking basically at uh, the shift in, in the criminal law focus from looking back and looking uh, to address a wrongdoing that has happened in the past to being forward looking. So seeking to, to prevent, to stop something from happening in the future. And what I have done and I have attempted to do uh, is to take this uh, uh, model, which has already been also, as you know, uh, developed in the context of the German legal scholarship with the, with the term, the state of prevention, look at it from a security perspective and apply it not only in EU law, but also in areas beyond criminal law. And look at the, a, 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 the preventive turn, if you like, in security policy by uh, states uh, and uh, the, in the EU, and we can see a lot of instances of EU law, uh, attempting to prevent conduct which is viewed by the state or in the eyes of the state as a security threat. And, you know, so this is not only criminal offenses, migration is very relevant to that because, you know, we are in this logic of where migrants being viewed as a security threat in many different guises, and we'll cover this in the context of this presentation, uh, but also uh, in terms of uh, 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 non-criminal law surveillance, uh, you know, in the field of counterterrorism, in the field of, uh, of security. Uh, the, my work is part of, I mean, of, as Violeta mentioned, it's an ongoing interest. I have written uh, in immigration law, including the criminalization of migration, uh, and another book uh, with a group of colleagues on policy and humanitarians, where we looked uh, at how migrant smuggling policies have evolved uh, on paper and on the ground. Uh, and that was the outcome of an ESRC funded project in the field. But also, uh, I think uh, in an attempt to theorize more broadly, and that's part of a broader um, research for a monograph on the European Union and preventive justice, which is under contract of 
Oxford University Press, and migration control is only part of it. It's not, it's not the whole thing. What the extra dimension that I would like to bring today, apart from this uh, framing of, uh, uh, of the preventive agenda in the field of immigration control in Europe, is to look at externalization, if you like, uh, not in as part of extraterritorial immigration control. I think a lot has been written and continues to be written on that because, you know, obviously we have many challenges on, on the high seas in the territories of, of third states. But to look today uh, at how the EU external border itself has been transformed in the context of this promotion uh, of, of a preventive uh, immigration uh, policy. And the argument here is to look uh, at how uh, the EU external border becomes a site, if you like, of preventive injustice or a site of exclusion. And I will put to you four examples of, of, of this trend of how the EU external border uh, is being transformed, uh, which stem both from uh, national practices and the uh, ability or inability of EU law to deal with them, but also in terms of the development of new proposals for EU law, which in my mind are particularly worrying uh, as we speak. And it is really a shift uh, because we know that when we talk about extraterritorial immigration control, then you know, we start from the premise that uh, at least states start from the premise that you know there is no jurisdiction for human rights application. We know about the debate on the extraterritorial uh, application of the European Convention on Human Rights from here and beyond, and the debate that we have currently about whether EU law applies on the high seas and in the territory of states. I, you know, EU lawyers, and perhaps you know you, you will disagree with me, would actually. Uh, believe that at the actually at the EU external border, the legal situation is more straightforward. You know, when someone has reached the actual border or the territory of any EU member state, EU law applies. You know, and we have the Schengen Borders Code. You know, and we have a number of provisions in EU law which tells us that you know once you are at the border, you know you are subject to EU law. But as I will attempt to explain today, the situation is not as straightforward because we we. We uh, are witnessing efforts uh, for, for this legal protection at the border or the legal protection that someone would expect normally to have when they reach actually the final destination or aim uh, being really negated as we speak. And I will focus on four different uh, elements of this denial, if you like, of rights or denial of law. And we can discuss them uh, from a rule of law perspective, if you like. The first uh, example is the denial of law. So we have situations where individual state country nationals have actually reached the border, or they have reached also the territory of EU member states, but the law does not apply to them. And I think that this is quite a worrying development. Uh, we have on the one hand, uh, an emblematic case where you know a lot of people have been writing about where the European Court of Human Rights, you know, the end the case uh, on the, 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 the Spanish enclave uh, borders, and you know what happened yesterday or the day before again in, in Spain on, on that. So you know, I ask you to reflect on this, where the Court of Human Rights came with quite a you know quite a, a surprising uh, judgment, uh, at least legally. Uh, from my perspective, where it said that uh, the law doesn't apply to these people. Uh, collective expulsion, you know, there's no breach of, of, of the, you know, the prohibition of collective expulsion because these people uh, were violent, were posing a threat to the state. Uh, they, uh, their own conduct uh, contributed uh, to the situation at stake and to their, you know, according to the, the word expulsion. Uh, and that uh, they didn't really reach the border through the designated border points. And I think, just reflect upon that. So, you know, if you have third country who have reached the territory where the rule is that the law applies, you know, so, you know, they, they can submit an asylum application uh, and the guarantees of national and European asylum law apply and the European Convention of Human Rights, yet yeah, the Court of Human Rights says, no, it is okay for these people to be done because it is their fault. They are dangerous. 
you will have a very interesting reversal of the asymmetry of violence from the state to the individual. It's very, I found very astounding in my view that the court said, no, it is their fault because they are violent in a sense where, you know, if you think of this in terms of balance and in terms of symmetry, you know, it must be desired. And the migrant is really viewed as, uh, as a threat and as, as a risk and as an unworthy, if you like, uh, agent of legal protection. So the rule of law does not apply here. Uh, and uh, it's fair game for states uh, if the, the conditions that the Court of Human Rights has, has outlined uh, have been met to really kick people out without any legal consequences. And since then, we have a very unstable evolution of the case law within the Strasbourg Court. Uh, and uh, it, it goes one direction and then another direction. So, you know, things are very fluid. But, but I think that what this does is it legitimizes exclusionary state practices. And the, the word I think that you perhaps have all been thinking about while I was speaking uh, is the is pushbacks. And you know, pushbacks we see a lot on the high seas and in relation with third countries, but we also see them now quite a lot at the external border. And I think that that is really a game changer here because the, we, what do we have here? We have a migrant which again reaches the border, so reaches the law in a sense, and then they are just pushed back. They're pushed back. Uh, and again, we have a situation where access to the territory or access to, to, to the border, if you like, does not mean access to, to law. Uh, that uh, the states uh, currently uh, are uh, attempting really to, uh, to, uh, to kick these people out, not only of the territory, but also of the legal system. And I think on pushbacks, I think there is a, quite a lot of political attention and justifiably so. But we really have a, a very big deficit currently as to how EU uh, institutions are dealing with this issue. I think our hopes are mainly reliant on the Court of Justice, if and when it comes on that, and uh, to some extent, the European Parliament. But you know, we uh, and you have some of you have been working on it in greater detail than I have. We know that the role of EU uh, bodies and agencies such as Frontex have been highly problematic in that regard. And I think a great challenge, I think, in this context is how uh, really to uh, make bodies like Frontex undertake a meaningful monitoring and scrutiny of state practice. Uh, we, we tend to, I mean, there are very sophisticated legal analysis of Frontex and responsibility. A number of you are doing PhDs on this, you know, responsibility from an EU law perspective, from an international law perspective. Um, there's a very big debate about uh, uh, legal accountability of Frontex, uh, the role of the Court of Justice. There is a pending action for failure to act. Before Luxembourg, it's interesting to see how the, uh, the, the court will, will deal with it. Uh, there are others who, uh, who place emphasis on the internal accountability mechanism of Frontex. Uh, the provisions within the regulation on the role of the director, for example, the human rights uh, officer. There are others like our colleagues, expert guide, who have argued for, a, for an in-between accountability route uh, via independent oversight, which is neither the internal or, nor the external, but in addition. But I think in my view, what is really missing there, and of course, accountability is very important, and the more avenues in my books, the better. But I think that I'm not sure whether the solution would come by revising the regulation itself or, or by courts taking it seriously, but we really need to have a meaningful responsibility of Frontex in my view for all operations where it is involved. I don't think any longer we can play with whether the responsibility is shared, whether the lead of the operations with a member state, whether Frontex uh, knows or it doesn't know. What I would argue, at least is, uh, if you like, uh, again, borrowing from criminal law, a strict liability of Frontex as regards its operations. I think it's not acceptable to have human rights violations in an operation involving Frontex without the agency having responsibility for this. Um, so, but I think the situation is very fluid and I think we have really uh, a multiplicity of situations where we have access to the border without access to law. And I think this is very problematic. It transforms the external border. So the, external, the border no longer brings access to the border, no longer brings rights with it. The second um, trend, I think, uh, which again 
is a sign of the times and it's a new, if you like, terminology within EU law, which is highly suspect uh, and very, very vague and very problematic from a, from a legality perspective in my view, is the, the recent uh, uh, discussion and proposals on the so-called instrumentalization of migration. Now, these, uh, these proposals are currently on the table. Uh, they are connected with the attempt of a number of EU member states to treat migration as a so-called hybrid threat. What is interesting, if you think from an international relations theory, if you, you know, after the Cold War, we had the Copenhagen School of International Relations, and they were arguing that uh, we have a shift from hard security, military security, to softer form of security, including societal security, uh, which includes immigration. And now you see this happening back full circle. So migration is going back to being viewed as a hard security threat, though it's being militarized in a sense again. And I think this is, again, very problematic. I mean, what is really a hybrid threat? I think Spain, again, if I'm not mistaken, recently uh, has attempted to include uh, irregular migration within the limit of NATO. I think that's another example, if you like, of this uh, tendency of uh, mili militarized framing. And we have these proposals in EU law, starting with a proposal uh, dealing specifically with emergency measures or regarding Lithuania, Latvia, and Poland but followed by a regulation which aims really to normalize emergency on instrumentalization of migration. And it attempts to give a definition, a legal definition of, of instrumentalization. I urge you to, to look at it in detail when, when a third country uh, instigates migratory flows uh, in order to encourage or facilitate movement and destabilize member states of the European Union. And it is interesting because this is really all politics. I mean, this in my view is not really a legal definition, let alone a definition within international migration law, refugee law or human rights law. It is really very bad practice and very shoddy, I think, for the commission to come uh, with a proposal which parrots really perceptions about migrants and to again treat migrants uh, A, as an instrument and B, as a weapon. So, you know, so we have this proposal, which is highly problematic, which if it is adopted, will mean that you will have a normalization, if you like, of the state of exception or of emergency at the border. It will mean that uh, the rule will be that everybody, all third country nationals, <laughs> irrespective of, of, uh, of their status claims and so on and so forth, uh, can be stopped, uh, you know, at the border, before the border, uh, and have very limited access rights. The third, uh, and I think what is interesting before I go to, 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 the, to the third level, uh, I, uh, there's a very interesting opinion by Advocate General Emilio recently in a case I think which was out in the court uh, a couple of weeks ago on Lithuanian national law uh, dealing with uh, in the instrumentalization debate, and it's interesting to see what the court will rule on that. The Advocate General actually rejected the argument of the Lithuanian government that Lithuanian law is justified by evoking the national security clause in Article 72 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union, and actually uh, said that uh, uh, the engaged us with the applicability of the ruling of the Strasbourg Court in ND and NT. Uh, and said that in his view, this does not apply here because the facts are different. But interestingly, he said that even if you accept that ND and ND is applicable in terms of the factual uh, framework, he believes that EU law offers a higher level of protection uh, through uh, articles 18 and 19 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So this is a very interesting finding in my view and quite reassuring if you like. And I think it invalidates to a great extent the, the, the very premise of the Commission's proposals on, on instrumentalization. I think I, I, my argument is that these proposals should, should really be scrapped. I mean, I don't think they add anything. And uh, I think situation, and I think the other general also argue that many of these cases can be dealt with by existing EU secondary law on, on asylum. So it's interesting to see what the court will say, watch this space probably after the summer. So the third trend, uh, so I, I spoke already about uh, access to territory, but uh, uh, without access to law. And there is also the reverse. So, you know, we have now situations whereby EU law aims to uh, uh, 
not to, to treat access to the territory as access to the territory. <laughs> I will explain what I mean with that. Uh, uh, scholars have used the, 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 the concept of the fiction of non-entry, uh, and this is really something that's very prevalent, in particular currently the proposals on the pact of, of migration and asylum, but this is not new, and the fiction of non-entry already exists in the context of EU asylum law, in the context of the application of border procedures. And I think some, some of you are, are working on border procedures and you know that we have a situation where EU law allows member states, so you know it is left to member states, but it's allowed by EU law to treat certain asylum applications differently on the border. I mean, where again, the, uh, the full uh, safeguards and uh, protection of the asylum key does not apply. So, so applications are dealt with more speedily uh, and uh, with the lower, if you like, safeguards. And so far, and there are many studies on this already, uh, we know that member states uh, are using these border procedures in different ways. Some of them do not call them as such. So they, they call them something else. There is a high level of legal uncertainty as to how these procedures apply, and uh, they also lead to uh, what is uh, called by scholars de facto detention. So you know when so when you stop someone again outside of the border, uh, and transit zones also can be used. So you know so we have already many rule of law questions on that, but what we have currently is the pact, which pushes this I think to a, to a step further because what the pact does. In two proposals, the recast asylum procedures uh, regulation and the pre screening regulation, what this proposal is to do is really to normalize uh, non entry in a sense. So, you know, so the categories of again migrants affected by that uh, increase. So, you know, uh, currently your asylum law and business is only in limited uh, circumstances, but currently the, the, the back really would apply this to the, the majority of their country nations reaching the external border. And the combination of, of the uh, procedures and of the screening measures also lead further to the securitization of migrants because the screening re regulation offers uh, really uh, uh, an enhanced the system of risk assessment of the third country nationals. And what's very interesting is that uh, the, uh, the debate on um, the assessment of migrants will be done also via recourse to the vast panoply in EU law of the various EU immigration databases, which are also accessed by law enforcement authorities. So, you know, so we will create a system whereby Again, uh, anyone who arrives at the external border is viewed in principle as prima facie risky. And you know, uh, it's very few of these people who will end up in the full, uh, in the full application of EU asylum law if these proposals are adopted in this form. I read yesterday that the screening regulation has been one of the few measures of the back where the council has reached a general approach last week and so negotiations will not go to the European Parliament. So, you know, so we have um, uh, entry without law and we have limited law without entry, if you like. So we have these two uh, uh, trends, uh, both leading, if you like, to exclusion. The last um, uh, example I think I want to give before I think opening for, for discussion because there's quite a lot has been covered here is I want really to refocus on the issue of detention of, of third country national. Detention is, is not really, uh, it is dealt with, but not, if you like, head on. Uh, detention, first of all, is an example, a clear example of, uh, of the criminalization of migration. A lot of scholars, especially in the United States, have she have looked at it from the perspective of the, of the so-called crimigration uh, debate. And they've looked at it from that perspective because what is detention? In a sense, you use criminal uh, mechanisms, criminal law enforcement mechanisms for uh, immigration control purposes. So, you know, you're using quasi-criminal measures uh, involving the privation of liberty for people who have done nothing wrong. So, you know, so you uh, states detain migrants not only for uh, over criminalized offenses, if you like, like the non-possession of documents, but they, they detain migrants also as part of immigration law. And in EU immigration law, 
there are three legal bases on tension. There is one on Dublin regulation. There is one on the reception conditions directive, and there is one on the return directive. And we have seen, I think, uh, uh, recently an attempt by the Court of Justice really to streamline this. And uh, there was a case where the court said that the meaning of detention should be the same across across these instruments across EU law. Um, but I think you you see uh, really the clear preventive aim of of detention because. Again, here people are being stripped of their rights, you know, in, in a very heavy way because detention has an, an impact on Article 3 CHR uh, without really having engaged in any wrongdoing and uh, really uh, just on the basis of the fact that they're viewed as a risk. And you know that in EU law, uh, one of the key foundations of detention is. Uh, whether someone is considered to be uh, a risk of outbound So, you know, and I think the Court of Justice has been trying really to bring some certainty into that. But again, the new proposals in the pact uh, aim to push detention and to normalize it further. I think that we see, and what I want you to keep from that is that while so far the, the courts have dealt with, with the fact that uh, detention uh, uh, emerges within the territory of the European Union. So, you know, in the context of reception conditions, now detention is going more and more and more again at the borders. So now we have uh, this preventive paradigm from the, from the inside to the borders. So, you know, we have the, the pact proposals really uh, normalizing detention of the EU external border. Uh, again, states are free uh, to, uh, uh, to accompany screening with detention. Uh, I understand that in the negotiations currently of these uh, instruments, uh, there, there are further um, grounds and opportunities for detention introduced by member states in the council. So, you know, this is not going away. Uh, and I think that uh, this is again, something that will be very, very controversial. Again, uh, there are two recent opinions uh, by other generals. Emilio, in the same opinion, uh, found that uh, the uh, the mere fact of irregular entry on its own does not justify detention. I think it's interesting to see what the Court of Justice will say about that. And Abjanel de Latour, in a case involving detention in the context of the return directive, uh, said, interestingly, that uh, you cannot detain someone on the grounds that he might commit a criminal offense in the future. So, you know, so you cannot detain someone on, on purely preventive grounds. And I think this is also applicable in the field of in the field of asylum. So, you know, so, so you have really these uh, uh, trends all happening at once. So, you know, you have on the one hand state practices, and I think the danger here, if you think about it, also uh, knowing what we know about how states treat migrants at the border or in transit zones, um, state practices are justified and even normalized uh, or uh, internalized by EU law in the pact. And I think that's quite a worrying trend because it should be the other way around. It should be EU institutions really placing limits to what member states are doing on the ground if it's not, if it's not compatible with EU law. And you have EU law at the same time, uh, really uh, secondary law lowering, if you like, the standards of the acquis. And I think the key question here is whether um, the EU constitutional key uh, will be influential, will play any part in the shaping of, uh, of the development of EU in the field. Because my reading on the, of the pact and in many of its proposals, not only those that we have discussed today, but others as well, are that they, they challenge really a European constitutional law in a variety of ways. We see the Advocate General uh, who has elevated, if you like, a constitutional approach of, of, of asylum through the charter as, a, as an EU benchmark in trying really to make sense of what's going on on the ground. But uh, I am worried that, you know, the, we will face the familiar pattern of the Court of Justice coming three or four or five years from now, once the pact proposals have been agreed. So I would urge all of you to think about what's going on currently, think about the many layers of exclusion and of prevention, not only extraterritorially, but at the border and also within the territory and engage with what's going on critically uh, and with an open mind. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to our discussion.
thank you very much. So um, we've invited people on online to to put their questions on the chat, but obviously those in the room can simply raise their hands and formulate their questions orally. This is mics in the room, so we should be able to <laughs> capture what you say quite easily. I don't know if perhaps we can take a question from the room, if anybody has um, any question, any point, any observation that you would like to make, while we give some time to those online to formulate their questions in the chat. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to break the, the eyes. Um, so I was actually quite intrigued by some if by the use of the tension and how you framed it, it's as if the tension when we moved towards the border it sort of reinforces the fiction of non-entry and non-deservability of legal protection as if bringing all the other three trends together and reinforcing them. And so I was wondering whether we could I mean, you could think about detention actually as an instrument that is not just paradigmatic of the preventive model, but as linking all the other three trends and reinforcing them and somehow just define them. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, then the key question would be, uh, as you pointed out at the end, whether new constitutional principles and constitutional values should impede that both conceptualization and manner of implementation of detention when being moved to the border in that symbolic capacity, but also practical capacity. Yes. So that would be my question for you. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I hinted at the latter towards the end. So I think that certainly uh, there is a need to be alert. And I think the Court of Justice actually uh, will come uh, to rule on this. I'm not sure exactly how helpful it will be. The Advocate General tried and whether the court would take a different view on detention at the border to detention within the territory. I mean, it's interesting to see whether, you know, the court will decide to have one line of case law for everything. The problem, and I agree with you that detention actually brings into the fore exclusion and all the trends because, because you know, you hear, and it's very real at the border because then you have confinement of people outside the territory or at the border. So, you know, the state is saying, no, you're not coming in. <laughs> That's highly symbolic and real at the same time. Um, the problem, I think, uh, and I th I, that's a very good PhD thesis, actually. <laughs> uh, it is that detention does not really have a very strong uh, legal framing uh, in EU law or in national law. And that's a rule of law challenge, an additional rule of law challenge that it poses itself. So, you know, so there are some provisions within secondary EU law. A lot of states use it unilaterally. They don't call it detention. So I think there are studies on how detention has been used, uh, you know, in, the, in border procedures. And uh, the studies point out that, you know, some members don't, don't call it detention, so they do not apply any safeguards, you know, some others uh, call it reception, some others call it uh, detention. So, you know, I think there is a need, uh, I'm not going to say uh, a need for harmonization, but I think there is a need of clarity of what's going on. And I think in this field, it's one of, Perhaps the most highly problematic fields detention because uh, in many cases, and we see also in the case of the Court of Justice with Hungary in the transit uh, zones, where you know states said no, it's not detention, and they don't recognize it as such. You know, this is not what happens. So you know, so I think we need to be vigilant and to call a spade a spade and to label things properly. And once we have done this, then I think it's easier really to bring European constitutional law and to bring the court really to to say to member states, no, you cannot do that. I mean, but I think that I'm, I'm waiting for the court's ruling now on the, on the Lithuanian case, because this, if the court adopts the, the Advocate General's approach, at least as regards the applicability of the charter, this challenges the pact quite a lot, I think. It's not only about instrumentalization, it's also about the border procedures pre-screening, because if the court comes and says, access to asylum is paramount, <laughs> under EU law, then I'm interested to see how the legislature will proceed, because currently much of what's going, what's going on is really to limit access to asylum. But thank, thank you for that. Thank you very much. 
We have two more questions on the chat. So one is from Elspeth. Um, and I mean, you, Balsamic, have mentioned the view of uh, the Advocate General, but she points to a different direction. And she mentions that there is an increasing amount of academic and NGO work, which indicates the problems of detention of migrants. In your view, what is the impact of this work? And perhaps what impact should it have? Because they are the ones sort of like mapping what is happening on the ground, right? Thank you, Elspeth, and hi, I'm sorry that you cannot be here. Uh, and these people include yourself, of course, and you know, we all, we all read, I mean, Elspeth published a wonderful study recently about how to, how to hold Frontex accountable. Uh, I recommend it. So um, I think that uh, they are absolutely valuable. Uh, I think it's essential for academics and NGOs to continue scrutinizing what's going on. In many respects, the work is invaluable because it's the only one that casts light of what's going on on the ground. I'm a firm believer on the need for scrutiny on the ground of what's going on in states. Uh, and I think that uh, the European Parliament has provided some of it, but the push has always been really from academics and in particular from civil society. And I think civil society has an, an increasingly important role to play, especially uh, in the face of uh, um, states, uh, you know, pushing back in the field of human rights. So, you, so we need to know what's going on. We don't know about the detention practice unless someone highlights them. So, you know, so I think it is very important. They they are important. I think in ensuring transparency and ensuring accountability and ensuring that we know what we're talking about and we know that pushbacks are taking place. For example, I, I read in Politico that uh, uh, the Greek migration minister appeared before the Libe committee to push back on pushbacks, if you like. And I think a lot of the of the pushbacks that are going on on the ground now are revealed by civil society. So, you know, so I think that, that that's true. So the, the answer to the question is yes, it is very important in terms of uh, alerting us to what's going on on the ground. In terms of developing the legal arguments, I mean, we have Violetta here who has been involved in litigation, uh, a very important one. Whether this influences the legislator, I think it remains to be seen. Uh, I think that, you know, there are efforts to influence the European Parliament, for example. Uh, I'm not sure about EU member states. I think positions are very entrenched, but you, we can only push if we know what's going on on the ground. And I think the role of both academics and civil society are really very um, I also have a question from Katerina Mazzilli, who thanks you for the talk and mentions that um, following what you said that Frontex should be held responsible for or for all their operations and human rights infringements. She was wondering whether you mean responsible in front of the European Court of Justice, other bodies, and maybe we can add responsible in some other way that it's not just legal accountability in front of the Court of Justice and similar judicial bodies. Yes, certainly before the Court of Justice. And I think that, uh, uh, I think there's a danger with Frontex that we hide behind, everybody hides behind very sophisticated, but sometimes obscure legal arguments about, you know, what is an act, what's an omission. These are all very good PhDs, by the way, you should all write them. Uh, but I think in reality, how, how, can, how can Frontex say that they didn't really know what was going on in operation, even when the operation was really led by a, by one EU member state. I think you know this is really not tenable in reality, and I think we shouldn't really shape the law in order to negate reality. And I think that it, it's a very big problem. Uh, and I think that uh, my hope really is not accountability is very important, exposed, but in my ideal world. We need to have a framework which will discourage Frontex taking a blind eye on pushbacks, for example, in the first place. So, you know, we should really uh, have a, a, the key EU agency for uh, responsible for, for managing the external border, really developing proactively uh, a rule of law and, the, and, the, and an EU law compliant approach, rather than coming exposed and saying, Oh, why didn't you catch the pushback and you know who is responsible for that? It's a bit too late if we come late. In a sense, it's better than nothing, but you know, but I think the point is really for these practices to, to be reduced or in you know, ideal world to be Can I ask a question? Of course, go ahead. Um, can LA 
the uh, militarization of borders and excesses at the border uh, in the context of state crime. Uh, to, uh, it can offer maybe a different perspective and a possibility of international, international sanction. I think it's a very the question because yes, I, I if I understood your question correctly, I think we have discussed this a bit earlier in the year as well about to look at what's going on at the border as a form of state crime. So you know to look at how states use use, how states uh, are involved in uh, the flows of migrants in a sense from the state crime. I think that's really, really you should do a PhD on that. I think it's a, it's a very interesting angle. It's an angle that no one has really taken seriously and uh, you see with instrumentalization for example the framing is that it's really again against the migrant in the sense of so the migrant is in this instrument of violence if you like or of war uh, whereas i think if you take it from the perspective of state action and this can work can work both ways you know can work uh, outside the border, inside the border, you know, it can work when you look at pushbacks, for example, you know, pushback practice, a uh, state crime. So, you know, I think there is a lot really to reflect on that. That's a very interesting perspective. Other questions from the room or from chat? We have one by Hans Lindahl. So he thanks you, Balsames, and congratulations for your new position, albeit it's a shame that you will be leaving Queen Mary. So I'm reading his words, not mine. <laughs> I wondered, <laughs> which are the same. <laughs> I wondered whether the court's ruling regarding boarding crossings in Ceuta and Ormelia as violent, so NDNNT, includes any traces one could tease out regarding <coughs> the violent origins of these exclaves themselves. It is as um, though the violent origins of these territories catch up with it from ahead in the form of border crossings that are prepared to use the very same force that build up the border to destroy it. I use um, includendi and excludendi that will pertain to the state seems to have a violent origin that is never fully covered. So perhaps, yeah, like zooming out, what? Yeah, I mean, what do you think? I appreciate the comment, Hans, and it's nice to hear from you. And thank you for joining. Uh, and another wonderful colleague who, you know, came at Queen Mary recently. And it's, that's why, you know, leading a law school can be rewarding, you know, you bring all these wonderful people. So, uh, yes, I, I, I think it's worth really looking at, uh, at borders and, and violence. And I, I think in this specific, I think what is interesting to reflect is whether this border has a specificity or not. So whether Ceuta and Melilla are different to Evros, for example, or the same. Uh, and we can reflect on that. Another uh, point of reflection, perhaps exactly on the, on the point of violence, is that uh, if I understood correctly, the, the facts of what happened yesterday or the day before uh, is that uh, we had the involvement of the Moroccan authorities. So, you know, so we had, so how, and then we'll see how, how would this play within, you know, this whole framework of NDNT where you had really violence you know, from the authorities, uh, not of the receiving state, if you like, but of another state close to the border. And whether the, the political background exacerbates violence, I think, you know, it's, it's worth reflecting upon, I think, in this context. But certainly there is a problem if uh, we view violence we identify in our discourse migrants with violence exclusively, I think. And because I think in the, there is an asymmetry of power always between the state and the migrant, whichever state we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or comments? Yeah, I no, I was very struck by your, uh, most by all of the thoughts, but your first point about the denial of law and what, the, the suggestion that basically it's not the absence of law that is the issue, but carving out individuals and carving out migrants from its protection. And I was wondering the link you see with the issues with the rule of law in member states at national level, which aren't necessarily migrant specific. Do you see it as somehow being related to this or migrants are being used as scapegoats to justify it as well somehow? Uh, 
I, there are scholars who are attempting to make this link. Uh, I'm a bit, uh, I think it's what we're describing, what we're discussing today, I think is even more brutal. I think rather than, I'm not downplaying the rule of law problems of not having an independent judiciary, for example. And, but I think here, what states are doing essentially is that they are saying that there are human beings who are not worthy of the law. So you are totally excluded. It's not that your system is corrupt or, you know, it is really that you would not have access even to bad law or to a tribunal which is not independent, you know, because there is some law there. Whereas here, I think, and you see how the foreigner, the third country national, is really rejected as a subject of law. And I think that is really important to think about because it's contrary to the European tradition of law, both in terms of EU law, many national constitutions, and the European Convention on Human Rights. And I think that's why NDNT is so problematic, I think, from the Court of Human Rights, because these are rights that apply to everyone. And this is what distinguishes, if you like, to put very simplistically, Europe, you know, from many other parts of the world, that, you know, even if you're a foreigner, you have rights. And here, you know, you have practices deliberately saying that this person will not have any rights, no law will be applied to them. As far as we're concerned, this person does not exist. And this is very blunt and very brutal. I have two um, questions that actually piggyback on, on, on this final point. Um, and I'm going to start with Elspeth's and move to, to, to the other because they are linked. So Elspeth, um, regarding the, the imbalance of power that you have mentioned, um, between the state and the non-citizens, what are the more promising ways of leveling the playing field, in your view? And there's one suggestion uh, coming from Andrea Contenta um, that concludes after hearing your presentation, for which you're very much thanked. Um, should we conclude that in advocating against pushbacks and violence, we should dig more into criminal law rather than asylum law? And for context, Watching the Greek migration minister of the Libre Committee yesterday, it seems as if the narratives of smuggling and right to enter are still hegemonic, while criminal responsibilities and accountability, particularly of authorities, uh, are normally minimized. So what will be the most productive way and what should we do in terms of the criminal law versus asylum law paradigm. I think, yeah, thank you for the questions. I think that these are not mutually exclusive. I think I always think that we should follow every, every avenue possible. I think criminal law, again, another PhD for some of you, uh, is a very interesting route. I don't think by itself it gives all the solutions. I think that we really need to have to debate and to contest and to try to ensure everyday rights on the ground for, for, for migrants. And I don't think criminal law will give you this. And I'm not sure how deterrent it will be at the end of the day, if someone is convicted by a criminal court, uh, that whether this will have the effect of stopping everything that states are doing. You know, I'm a bit dubious about that, but I think it's a good avenue to follow both at domestic criminal courts and at the ICC and the, you know, the courts there. So, you know, but this will give you very limited solutions, I think. I think the everyday fight and struggle, uh, if you like, is to really ensure the rights of third country nationals, the applicability of the law, the rule of law, if you like, to the foreigner, if you like. And I think that what Elspeth has asked, uh, I think we all have a responsibility. I think that uh, I'm, I'm, I would like your views, especially those of you who are earlier career uh, researchers, uh, to give a clever answer to Elspeth, a meaningful one, uh, beyond the answer that, uh, yeah, let's all litigate. Of course, we will litigate, and litigation is our primary weapon or the one that we know how to use. Uh, the transparency route is another very important one. I think, you know, we talked about NGOs earlier and civil society and academics. But if we can think of other avenues of really making rights real, you know, we should all really engage in that and reflect on this. Thank you. I don't know if any, anybody has any other question building perhaps on this issue that Balsamis has launched <laughs> and proposed that we should all reflect on collectively. Uh, 
say, I mean, I'm personally, yeah, we have another question, but I mean, just one uh, thing that I was um, very struck by what you said that the law is being used to negate reality. And once you negate reality, you can also negate rights. So I suppose, I mean, one thing that we should all be pointing um, our, I mean, focusing attention on is on how and why reality should not be negated. And it's important that it law remains grounded as a regulator of interpersonal and institutional um, relations in, in, in on the ground, right? And that would perhaps open up a glimmer of hope to <laughs> for right to be regained. And it gives all of us a role as well as civil society organizations to be focused on, on, on reality and to dismantle the dominant narratives and to make the point that law needs to be grounded on, on, on real facts rather than being used to negate them. Challenge the, I mean, the last question. I'm grateful because to challenge also the narratives, you know, especially on smuggling. I think, you know, uh, the current practice in Rwanda linked to smuggling. I mean, if you listen to the state narrative on that, and you know, so, and then that the flaws themselves undermine the rule of law. And I found this quite ingenious, you know, for from the government to say, and I think it's our responsibility really to challenge when we can. Uh, also in terms of public opinion, uh, because I think this has an influence on how how everything is being framed. We have a, a number of other questions. I, I see them you. coming, yes. <laughs> 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 so, Ianulo Lua um, would like to ask your opinion on how bilateral agreements between EU member states and other nations, such as the EU-Turkey deal, influences pushbacks. Would you say that such agreements are legitimate? And secondly, how do you think such bilateral agreements can be used as a basis of defense by a migrant to defend their rights? Lastly, would you say a migrant held in detention on the territory of a third country can bring a claim against an EU member state for its involvement in his hair detention? Thank you for these easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, these are all very good questions. I think that uh, uh, on the last one, I think there is a very, and the number of you in the room I know are working on similar issues, not exactly on the same, uh, but on the extent of responsibility of the EU and of its member states when things are happening in third states. And I think this is really the next battleground, if you like, on extraterritorial immigration control. Uh, uh, beyond the high seas, you know, what is happening in the territory of the third states, and can we really hold EU member states or the EU itself responsible for, for detention conditions in Libya, in Turkey, uh, for stopping flows of migrants in the territory of, of a third state on the basis of intelligence produced or shared by Frontex, by Eurosur, you know, these are very big questions and many more PhDs for you to write. So <laughs> I think that you can de definitely try uh, to make to make the claim and use uh, your legal uh, panoply, use your different sources of law, you know, look at how you, where you law can get you, where different sources of international law can get you in order to, to really promote uh, these arguments. So that, that's what I would say. I think certainly it's worth trying. Uh, and yeah, we will stop here. Okay. Right. Um, there is a point also by Maeva Disco uh, on the idea that certain individuals are deprived access to the law um, and that this would be contrary to the tradition and legal obligation to respect the rule of law in the European Union. Um, and the question is how to reconcile this with the right that states have to control their borders. And looking at the Ukrainian example, um, so Ukrainian nationals have been exempt from visa obligations under the Schengen uh, Aki. And it is obvious that access to law and to protection following the activation of the Temporary Protection Directive was actually a much more effective um, alternative for them than all of what we have been discussing that come under the new act proposals. So what about um, adopting these as an alternative, I suppose, and what about the nationals of other countries who do not benefit from these same kind of exceptions? So it's a composite question yeah. in, in, in three parts. 
to make it again easy for you. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think just to, to, to back to the first part, I think on, on the right of stage to control their borders. And I think in, in societies based and written by the rule of law, sovereignty does not mean arbitrariness. And the, the right to control your border is also underpinned by a number of, of human rights responsibilities. You know, and, the, and responsibilities also arising from EU law. So, you know, the EU EU member states have responsibilities under, under the EU treaties, and, and it's not only secondary law. And I think that's something we should always remember. You know, some I see some arguments that are only based upon, you know, the text of Regulation X, and all, but no, I mean, you have the Charter and you have the ECHR and you have the Geneva Convention. And so, you know, so states cannot do what they like. And I think that sometimes for states, this is hard to accept. We see it a lot uh, in, uh, in the UK currently, I think with the debate on Rwanda, where we have this discussion about, no, but, you know, let's, let's do whatever we want. And, uh, life is more complex than that in societies that are liberal democracies and by the rule of law. The second point, it has been raised quite a lot, I, I think, and uh, why Ukrainians and not others. Uh, I think that there uh, it is something that uh, if you see the glasses half full, you can say that it has proven uh, that you can use the Ukraine precedent for future migration flows. I think it's too late to deal with the past, perhaps, but, you know, you can argue that, look, this has worked. So, you know, why why not uh, really uh, normalize it in the, in the context of European migration policy and migration management policy? You know, the, if this has worked with one category of, uh, of third country nationals, why not, you know, address it in, in, in future uh, in future flows? So, you know, I think that's how, that would be my take on that. Uh, we, we can draw our own conclusions why it was easier to, to, to apply to Ukraine than to other situations. Thank you. There, there, there are two further questions. One more from Elspeth. Do you see a separation of law and executive action in this area with law and its institutions being squeezed out of the area? I think that's an ongoing Battle elsewhere. I think that uh, there is certainly an attempt by the executive uh, to do that. We see it a lot in the UK as we speak. Uh, and I think it, we will see how resilient the institutions will remain, especially courts. Andrew is nodding <laughs> there, uh, because it is really, and you see in a lot of uh, instances that uh, the, the executive really throwing the ball back to courts and saying, you know, if you're there, you know, now. Let's see whether well, you would hold against me. What is really concerning, I think, in my view, is that there is a lot of practices currently which are uh, happen routinely and with a degree of opacity that does not even give institutions a role. I mean, if you think of what's going on, for example, on the external border in Greece, for instance, and with pushbacks, I wonder what role. Greek courts actually have in all of that. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, I think we need really to look at the degree of transparency, accountability of, of practices on the ground. And I think that's, that's, for me, that's very, very important. I think it's important to challenge what's going on on the ground, to challenge the practice on the ground, not to accept uh, what, what we are being told, you know, and really to have, that's why civil society is important, you know, and what's, that's why uh, we need to document, you know, what is happening in order then to ensure the, inter the intervention of these other institutions, because otherwise the, the institutions will never have any chance. That actually tallies with the next question we have by our PhD students, Vasiliki Patsidou. She um, mentions that the fundamental rights monitoring mechanism that is proposed at the borders may be useful. I mean, that's part of the reform that the European Commission is putting forward. As part of the Act. But it also depends on transparency and independence of um, monitors. Um, so on the basis of this, and perhaps uh, to, to add to, to that observation, I mean, I, I wonder whether, because there's always a lot of optimism that is attached to monitoring mechanisms. Problem being that no amount of transparency and independence will make monitoring into a reparatory tool in the sense that you can denounce that the damage is happening or is bound to happen if you do things in the way that have been proposed by the Commission. 
So I don't know whether monitoring per se offers a remedy or offers good enough a palliative to undo the three trends plus the tension that you've been discussing. Okay, so uh, the, I'm arguing that most of it should be undone. And a lot of these, uh, especially things like instrumentalization, I, I can hope this will fall at some point, but uh, monitoring is very important in my view, not so much to remedy uh, what has happened in the past, but to generate transparency and to give states a sense that they are, someone looks at what they're doing, you know, that they're not totally uh, uncontrolled or uncontrollable, that there is someone there who is independent and who can, you know, document really a pushback, or, you know, who can say to the border guard what you're doing is illegal as we speak in real time. So don't hide behind the fact that no one told you or that, you know, that. so I think, and for me, and I argued, I have argued also in, in, in my work on European criminal law, things like European arrest warrants and so on, that it is, that's what will make a real difference. If you have someone monitoring your detention center, monitoring your prison condition, monitor, because uh, otherwise uh, everyone hides behind it in the boxes on, on implementation of directives and of regulations. And that, 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 that does not reflect reality again, to go back to the point. So monitoring has a very important role, but it will not solve all of your problems. I mean, you, you need a multi-layered approach uh, on that. And you need to challenge also the perceptions and the, there's a question there, yes, I saw your hand, but, but also the, you know, the justification for instruments. I and mean, if you look at how the commission has justified the pact, you know, we can sit together as a group and deconstruct every single paragraph of justification. And say, really, is this the case? You know, I don't think so. so. You know, so I think we need to work on many grounds. It's a tall order, but you know. I mean, what I meant was that monitoring cannot launder the legality of certain. No, no, abso uh, absolutely solutions. not. Monitoring will not. The fact that you have monitoring does not absolve you of anything else. No, I think you you need to have all the other avenues. Uh, but I think it's hoped that monitoring will give greater transparency and perhaps a greater sense of limits for executive action on the ground. Thank you. Good question. Got a question? Yeah, um, I, I would like to ask you about uh, borders in, in, of the European Union and how European Union uh, protects the borders. And um, as, as, as we uh, a little bit mentioned a situation about uh, Ukraine, I would like to ask uh, in this context and um, like for decades, uh, European Union obviously protected their borders and not just their borders, but using borders of uh, South countries and trying to keep uh, migrants in some other countries, in countries of origin. Uh, and uh, in the Ukrainian case, obviously, uh, European Union is countries of origin. We don't have uh, another countries except uh, Moldova and uh, countries of aggression. And, uh, but my, my question is uh, about uh, a male ban of living. So, so I mean, uh, in the first day of aggression, Ukrainian authorities banned uh, the whole man population age 18, uh, 60 from leaving uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, they still keep in all these uh, female population in Ukraine. Uh, so from this perspective, could we uh, argue that uh, by this action, uh, Ukrainian authorities uh, protect uh, European uh, Union borders from female uh, Ukrainian migrants by keeping them uh, in the territory? Because uh, by uh, United Nations uh, statistic, 90% of uh, Ukrainian migrants, they are kids and women. And so uh, not discussing these, um, if there, there is a, a human rights violation, uh, obviously we discussed, but obviously Syria, for example, they use, but for much more shorter, these similar band, but for men age uh, until 45, much uh, limited uh, group of people. So by keeping all of these male population, Ukrainian population in Ukraine, could we argue that European Union benefits from that and use this approach uh, like uh, protect uh, the borders of migrants? Right, so I, I will make 
two attempts to to address your very interesting uh, comment. The first one, I think, I think probably there's a difference between intention and effect. Mm -hmm. So a difference between intention and effect. So you know, so I don't I, the way I see it, but I'm you know you, you know much better than I do. The fact that you you want your male population to be there uh, is probably because you want them to to fight. Uh, and I don't think the intention necessarily is to stop them from going to the EU to create a migration flow for, from the EU, which is male. But the effect, as you said, is that most of the flows are the flows of women and children. I don't know. I think we may discuss, if you want, this is a political question, really not a legal question so, so much, about whether the, the difference between Ukraine and Syria is really a difference in terms of male-female or is a difference in terms of religion and cultural background? I mean, I will leave it open. I will not say my view, but you know, we, we can discuss maybe other things. Thank you. Any further questions? Any comments, observations? Okay. Um, I think there are lots of parallels to draw between what the EU is doing and what the UK is doing. Um, uh, and do you think the EU will go in a similar direction to the UK? Uh, it seems like that's the case, but I just wanted to know what you thought. I think, thank you for that. I think sending there are parallels in the sense that uh, the aim is really to stop from coming from the border, from coming from the territory. The EU, of course, is not something. Uh, uh, homogenous, you know, there are also different member states uh, that have their own different policies uh, so far. And, and you could argue, for example, that uh, uh, the UK Rwanda uh, policy uh, has expressed itself, for example, in countries like Denmark uh, already some time ago, which are EU member states, <coughs> and other EU member states have also been experimenting in different ways. So if you look at Italy and the way it cooperates with Libya, I mean, uh, you know, you can argue that it's, it's something that is not as, you know, in your face as Rwanda, where there's a lot of symbolic politics there, the flight, you know, for political reasons, you know, we fly these people there and so on. And what's going on, you know, within the border countries of the EU and third states, where you know there's quite a lot which is hidden, and that's why NGOs are so important. So, so I think there is a commonality, if you like, of trying to keep it loud. But I think it's interesting to see how the discourse is played out in different contexts, how migrants are represented as well. So the commonality also, which I find very interesting, someone I think in the in the chat has raised it. Uh, is how smuggling is used by states within the discourse in order to restrict the access of, of migrants to the territory. So, you know, it is as if we need to stop them in order to save them. It's not only the saving lives at sea, but it's the ruthless smuggling networks and so on and so forth. Which the and there you definitely see a commonality. I think the, the, how, how this is used is very, very interesting. <laughs> Starting in 2015, UK starting in 2012. So it's <laughs> even, even earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, just to make a comment for everybody, yeah, it predates 2012. Yeah, sure. it's even yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. There's a question. We have two. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, just like a little comment of what you said. Like uh, you mentioned about like how we are how they like do this discourse, saying that we are protecting them. So it's something like just an observation what happened to Spain that you mentioned before is that Spanish authorities are saying that these like all this massacre that happened there, it was in a Spanish history, which was like the mafia. So it's there is the mafias who are killing them. It's not the state, nothing to do with that. Yes. You know, it's just the mafias, they're killing themselves. Yes. So it's kind of like just remind me that it's true, it's true. It is really it's the mafia, it's the networks, it's the smugglers, it's the organized crime. Uh, these people are in danger and will much safer if they stay where they are. That's the discourse. Question from Medna. I just uh, wanted to ask something regarding the, the smuggling measures. Like it, it's supposed to be actually controlling the trafficking and smuggling of migrants, but how do we actually look at or like ch even challenge like smuggling efforts or like measures that contribute in the increase of smuggling? Um, and I'm actually reflecting or like um, pointing to the smuggling issue in Libya where migrants are being intercepted, sent back to detention centers 
that are actually run by militias, sold and resold by different militias. So in a way, these kind of measures are enforcing the practices of these militias. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. And I think it's worth uh, raising it as well. So, you know, I think because so far, I think what you see at least in the UK, but also I think in Europe is that the argument is that uh, if you have safe routes, you know, to entry, then you will not have smuggling, which is, is a fair point. And I agree. But I think with the point that you made is a separate one. And I think it's worth uh, raising as well that the, the policy is currently strengthened. So the restricted policy is the restricted policy that strengthen organized crime networks rather than uh, the other way around. And in terms of like challenge again, we refer to like the monitoring and the role of like uh, civil society and so on. Beyond this, like how this is being challenged. Right? It's very difficult to act in third states, especially when you mentioned Libya. I mean, that's a very big challenge. How do you document what's going on? In a sense? I mean, it's really very, very difficult there. It's easier to some extent to look at the EU external border itself. So, you know, although again, there are many problems, but if, if there's a land border, you know, you can have some sort of documentation. But in a Libyan camp, you know, I think the question is who is going really to document what's going on. Uh, and, this, and this is very important. I think that's an extra. I mean, you answered partly to people's question, Merna. So, you know, that, that's an extra line of discourse that can be raised. It can be raised by people like yourself, you know, by academics, you know, by civil society, and be documented and say, look what's going on in the third states. This is the, this is the responsibility of, of, of the EU. And I think I would. I would make it a bit more public. Those of us all of you with access and with knowledge of what's going on, you know, it is there to make it public and to make it subject to people. Thank you. Thank you very Can much. Can I ask a last question? Yeah, please go ahead. And, and I'm just um, taking, I mean, considering the time. So uh, this would be, if not the final, <laughs> the final questions <laughs> for our speaker. Um, you talk about uh, uh, countries. Uh, attempts regarding preventing all migrants' uh, entries. I mean, uh, stop everything to prevent all migrants. Uh, but some countries didn't or couldn't uh, do that. And uh, there is a severe imbalance of uh, population, for instance, in Libya, in Turkey. And now, uh, at the moment, it is being discussed uh, that in Turkey, for instance, that Syrian refugees uh, should be sent back to their countries uh, voluntarily, uh, in theory, uh, by creating a safe zone in Syria. Uh, is this step uh, comparable to the UK Rwanda policy, uh, or is it legitimate? Uh, what do, what do you think? I think it is not, but uh, I think it have to uh, have to be uh, done something. I don't know how to. Yes, no, no. I mean, I, I think well, I think you have a direct route in a sense because if you're talking about sending them back to Syria, you have a very strong argument that Syria is certainly not a safe country for anybody to be in. So I think. That's the, the challenge, I think, uh, very directly, because it's a direct, uh, it's a direct transfer, if you like. If you're talking about them to Syria, you know, you, can say you cannot send anyone to Syria. You know? it's, not, it's not really compatible with any norm of law. I think it's more complicated if you are in Greece and you, you send people to Turkey uh, and you say it's a safe country and you can send them there. The big challenge, I think, for the European Union currently is how to make the right to seek asylum effective, because all the moves, as we were discussing, is against this. This is a right that is being under attack, uh, because I think we're going to a situation where uh, lodging a claim is becoming more and more and more difficult. And this is when I think the role of the countries becomes, uh, becomes close to the countries. Increasingly, 
but I think legally, I think we can, uh, the legal arguments are related to, to the position of Syria as a, as a state. But We have one other question coming through the chat. Um, and I'm going to ask everyone who wants to have one final question to do so very quickly and formulate it in their heads or on the chat, but mindful of the fact that at five, we should be finishing because there are some celebratory drinks that are waiting for us upstairs. And so <laughs> it would be great to keep them uh, still cold by the time we arrive. So Setnem Danachi asks, um, whether you can consider the state of exception as a loophole for states to justify their preventive measures at their borders. So if the state of exception ultimately leads to the suspension of rights of those outside the country in order to preserve national security and thus the rights of those inside the country, it seems that this is an effective way to maintain preventive external border measures because it is the state who decides the exception meaning when there is a situation of a state of exception. And what she has in mind are the migrants stuck at the Belarus-Polish border and how it was framed as a migration crisis at the, at the doorstep of the European Union external borders. But in fact, looking at the numbers, they were, I mean, the, 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 the situation is comparatively small when, when considering um, the higher numbers of those crossing the Mediterranean Sea. So it appears that this state of exception is something that states can exploit to, to their advantage. Yes, I think the point is an excellent one. And I think that what is interesting is that uh, it has raised or been raised also by Hungary. Uh, and it's interesting to see that so far the Court of Justice is adamant that this is not a national security issue. Uh, the legal framing is whether states can use Article 72 of the TFEU in order to derogate from, from the treaties and from EU law. And, and so far, the Court of Justice is not having it at all. And it's saying, no, it's not, uh, it's not a national security issue. It's not an emergency. It can be dealt with under current EU law. So, uh, but uh, indeed, the framing is a framing of militarization increasingly. And that's why, in my view, instrumentalization, for example, is very worrying because you take this situation that was described on the border and you generalize it. You know, you have a measure that applies to all, you know, across the EU, to all external borders. And the question then also legally is who claims instrumentalization and who decides whether instrumentalization has occurred? I mean, the current proposal is for the commission to do that. But, you know, I wonder how this may work in practice. So uh, it is very subjective, it's very political, and it, is really, it can really be abused in a sense. And I think it's interesting because so far, if you, if you look at this text, if you look at the pact as well, you have a lot of implicit or explicit references to abusive migrants or abusive asylum claims, you know, the, the notion of abuse to justify border procedures and so on and so forth. And no one talks about the abusive state where, you know, the state cl makes claims that again are not consistent with reality or, you know, frames an issue in a manner that, uh, that will yield certain results that are really very exclusionary. Last chance for anyone who has a burning final question or issue. If not, okay. <laughs> I'd like to invite everyone in joining me to thank uh, Valsame for a wonderful session. Thank you very thank much. You very Thank you very much to the people in the chat. They're also virtually applauding. So <laughs> um, thank you all very much. As I said, this is the final, the closing lecture of uh, this calendar, at this academic year of events. Uh, on celebratory drinks very upstairs, nice. room 313. Everyone is invited. Uh, and I'll just post it on the chat here, the, um, the website that you all know about the, the, uh, from the center where new events will be advertised uh, soon of academic year 22-23, starting in September. So thank you all very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.